So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here for the first time giving this talk to you in my first winter meeting. So today I will talk about... Uh, welcome. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I feel very welcomed, I have to say. Um, so today I will talk about development of stone fruit flavor. So in order to give you an overview of the presentation, I will start, so as I am a new face, I want to talk a little bit about my background, so you know a little bit more about me, about what are our lab's research interests that are in constant evolution, because we are learning more about the industry, and then move into what is stone fruit flavor, why is it important, and what are some of the factors that are affecting the development of flavor in order to wrap up with some take-home messages and some hopefully useful tips. So in order to begin a little bit about myself, I am originally from the end of the world, from this long and thin country uh, called Chile, and specifically from the capital city, Santiago, where I obtained my bachelor's degree as well as my master's with a big focus in fruit production and specifically in fruit post-harvest physiology and fruit ripening and everything related with improving fruit quality. After I finished, I had the opportunity to work around one year in the research and development department of a chemical company, where what we were doing is applying different chemicals at different stages of development of the, of the fruit and understanding how would that impact overall fruit quality. After that, I was um, lucky enough to join as a research associate into a, working into a stone fruit breeding program in Chile, which was a very nice collaborative effort between academia and industry. We were working together with the Association of Fruit Exports from Chile, and the objective of this breeding program was to develop varieties that could have better fruit quality as well as shelf life capacity, with a big emphasis on consumers. And I have to say that it was at this point of my career where I really wanted to make a stronger impact in terms of understanding food quality and helping to improve it. So I thought I needed to learn a little bit more and go deeper. And that's when I decided to leave the end of the world and come to the States and I went to get my PhD degree at UC Davis. So I went to California. So in California I worked during like five years with plums, trying to understand different mechanisms related with fruit quality. I focused a lot in sugars and how could that influence not only the sweetness, but also the tolerance of fruits to different stresses, as well as the nutritional value of fruits. And also how different hormones are regulating this and how can this help us to understand how to better handle our fruit. And then after I finished my PhD, I stayed a little bit longer in Davis, but in a different position, in this case as a postdoctoral post scholar. In this case, I started working with melons, specifically with cantaloupes. And here again, I was working with a breeding program. I was helping them try to improve their texture and flavor related attributes with different melon selections they had. And again, this was a combined effort between the university as well as a seed company called HM Clause. And I was there until September of last year, where I left the West Coast and I came to the East Coast, starting a position as an assistant professor and extension specialist in the University of Maryland. So my job is mainly to work with fruits and trying to work in pre-harvest as well as post-harvest factors. So with that said, I just want to quickly go into what are some of the research interests of my lab, which already you might have an idea based on my background. So what we are really focused on doing is to trying to develop novel strategies in order to improve fruit quality, fruit shelf life capacity, nutritional value, safety, marketability of the fruit, but also very importantly, consumer satisfaction. We try to do this at different stages of development of the fruit, at early stages, at harvest, but also with a focus on what happens after harvest, in post-harvest. And we are trying to achieve this objective also, integrating the needs of the different components of the food supply chain, looking at breeders, growers, distributors, and again, very importantly, trying to integrate the consumers. And here, 
what I am just highlighting are some of the research interests that we have as a lab. This again, it's not an exhaustive list, this is evolving all the time. So one of the objectives that we have as a lab is trying to assess the impact of how pre-harvest practices and environmental factors are going to be affecting fruit quality, nutritional value, shelf life capacity, safety of the fruit, marketability, as well as consumer satisfaction. Then we are also very interested in the characterization and early prediction of fruit physiological disorders that can occur during pre as well as during post-harvest. We are interested in understanding how different hormones can be related to fruit ripening behaviors and how can this can help us develop strategies to handle fruits better. And last but not least, we are also very interested in the intersection between fruit quality, microbial fruit safety, as well as fungal pathogens. So uh, these are some of the interests and this is where it comes that please you help me out by filling this survey, it's the orange one, because this really is asking what are your priorities, what do you think, so this will help me a lot to tailor a lot better my research. So I please encourage you to fill it out, it would help me very much. So having said that, I want to move on into talking about stone fruit flavor. So what is stone fruit flavor? And for this, I will just start by highlighting that when we talk about stone fruit quality and consumer acceptance, there's three main aspects or attributes that we are mainly focusing in. It's color, texture, and flavor. All of this combined together is what is going to define fruit quality. So briefly talking about each one of them, when we talk about color, this is what happens to our fruits in early stages until we have a fruit ready to eat. We have important changes in color that are going to mainly be due to the degradation of pigments such as chlorophyll, but also to the accumulation of other types of pigments like anthocyanins and carotenoids. And all these changes in colors that we see that are very important for the marketability of our fruits are mainly detected by our senses of the eyes. Then we have texture, another key component of fruit quality. We know that fruit softening is going to be crucial for handling our fruit as well as for the post-harvest potential of our fruits. Here we can see very different textures at different stages of development of fruits. And all these changes that occur in terms of texture are going to be due to modifications that are occurring at the level of cell walls in the fruit, turgor pressure changes, as well as the composition of the skin or the, cut, the cuticle of fruits. And generally, texture changes are going to be perceived by our sense of touch. And then we move into flavor. Flavor that is this highly complex trait that generally, when people talk about flavor, they are always thinking just about taste. But my message to you here is that it's really a complex trait. Definitely, flavor is composed by taste, what we perceive with our mouth, and it is composed by the sweetness of the fruit. We want, of course, to have high concentration of sugars. And on the other hand, by the acidity. We want to decrease the level of organic acids. So flavor, taste, sorry, is going to be defined by the quantity of sweetness and acidity, the composition of these sugars and acids, but also trying to find this balance that is going to be acceptable for the consumers. But flavor is not just taste. It's also the interaction of taste with all these aroma volatiles that the fruit is emitting as it develops and specifically during its ripening phase. So there's a series of volatile compounds that are going to be produced all the time by the fruit and it's going to affect how we perceive that fruit that we are eating. And just to give you a practical example, when you have a cold or if you eat a fruit and you just block your nose, the, the perception of the flavor is going to be completely different because you immediately are blocking this perception of the aroma volatiles. So another important thing that makes flavor so highly complex trait is that it is really strongly contributing to the liking of the fruit and it's very close to what human perception is related to. So, of course, when we are producing fruit, we do not want to have this type of disappointed consumers. We want to have consumers that are really enjoying what they are eating. So, the message here is that when we are doing research on fruit flavor or trying to improve flavor in fruits, we always have to be working very linked 
to what consumers are perceiving. And that's when a science, the, the science of sensory analysis comes into play. Generally, when we are doing this type of experiments, we are always trying to associate it with really people tasting our fruit and giving us their perception. So this makes it really complicated. We have to think of taste, of aroma volatiles, but also what really a human being is perceiving. So it's a lot of things in together. So that's in general what flavor is. And now, why is this important? And in order to start talking about this, I thought it was a good idea to show you this graph that may, mm, all of you I, am, I know are aware of. And it is just showing us the US per capita per capita peach consumption throughout a range of more than 20 years. And what we can see is how really there was, has been just this tendency to decrease in the rate of peach consumption. And this is due to disappointed consumers most of the time. So what I want to do now is just show you or walk you throughout how fruit flavor has a niche or a space in the overall fruit supply chain based on the objectives of the different components of this food supply chain. So starting, for example, with the breeders. Everything starts there, right? They are the ones that are going to develop the cultivars that you are going to establish in your fields. So when breeders breed for new cultivars, what are their main objectives, generally? I think this is changing in the late years, but generally. They are thinking of high yield, high size, disease resistance, long shelf life, strong flesh firmness. This is generally what they are looking for. Then we have the growers, all of you guys. What are you going to be expecting of the fruit that you really harvest? You want fruit with high yield, with good fruit size, this is resistance, that you can harvest in the minimum intervals. It has a nice appearance, right? Then we have the intermediates, the packers, the shippers, the distributors. What are their objectives? Long shelf life, flesh firmness, texture, appearance, good size, free of blemishes, right? And then we move into the last component of the food supply chain, consumers. What do consumers want? They want fruit flavor, health benefits, nutritional value of this fruit. So clearly we can see that there is a big inconsistency of what consumers are looking for in a fruit and what the whole overall food supply chain is providing them. So with this, my main message to you is that we really have to focus on consumers and that fruit flavor presents a major opportunity to grow markets. So now I want to walk you through some of the factors that are affecting stone fruit flavor development. So there are several factors. We have, of course, genetic background, the selection of the cultivar as well as the rootstock and the interaction between both are going to be key for, this, for the development of flavor. We have environmental conditions playing a role. We have pre-harvest orchard management practices, maturity at harvest as well as post-harvest practices. So let's begin with overall genetic background. So here <coughs> we are talking specifically about the selection of the cultivar that we are going to establish. And this is just showing us that in terms of peach, there is a lot of diversity of flavor profiles that is going to be found in different cultivars. If we think about peaches with different flesh color, yellow, white, or red, all of them are going to have different flavor profiles. Then cultivars with adherence of the stone to the flesh, when we talk about the free stone or the cling stone types, those are also having different flavor profiles. If we have melting texture, non-melting, or we are talking about stony hard peaches, all of these are different too, as well as other examples. But in general here you can see we are comparing a free stone melting cultivar versus a cling stone non-melting cultivar. And generally the one that is preferred for fresh consumption is going to be the free stone melting. That is also the most hardest to handle because both of them have different flavor profiles. So the main message here is that if the genetic material with which you are starting in your field has not been bred for flavor related traits, they will never be developed in the field. So when you are choosing your cultivars for establishment in your orchards and you are looking for flavor, you have to make sure that what you are establishing really has that capacity. Then it's not only about the cultivars, you know, but we also have to think about the rootstock. 
So rootstock is going to be influenced, is going to also influence the performance of the flavor attributes of the scion cultivar. Why? Because it's going to be having relation with the water relations, the nutrition, the vigor of the tree, when the bloom time is, the efficiency of the yield, as well as the ripening time and the harvest maturity. So again, it's very important to consider these cultivar rootstock interactions when we are thinking about stone fruit flavor development. That's why it's always recommended to do these small trials in your orchard and look at how these cultivars or cultivar rootstock interactions develop in terms of the fruit. Then a second crucial factor in terms of stone fruit flavor development are environmental conditions. We all know that sunlight, humidity, temperature, photoperiod, the soil, moisture, everything is going to be affecting also the flavor profiles of our fruits. We are going to have different flavor profiles based on the growing seasons and the locations, among even trees within the same orchard or even fruit located at different parts of the same tree. So it's always important to consider this genotype or this cultivar rootstock interaction with the environment. These are always interacting and being key on the development of flavor. So again, the message, stone fruit flavor development can vary according to the environmental conditions. You, that's why it's important to do these small trials and understand how these cultivars are behaving in your own environmental conditions. It's difficult to extrapolate what is happening in a different weather to what will happen in your case. Then we have pre-harvest orchard management practices. Here you all can have a big control on this and they are also being a key factor in terms of flavor development. So when we talk about pre-harvest management practices, it's as you all know, we are talking about light mani manipulation of the tree, fruit canopy position of the fruit, the architecture of the canopy, fertilization, crop load, irrigation, the application or not, and when of plant growth regulators, planting density, among many, many others. All of these management practices are going to again be playing a role in the flavor development of fruits we have that there is research that is needed in order to be able to identify which are kind of these optimal cultural practices that can maximize flavor quality. We have examples of these optimizing crop load. Generally, when you go to very high yields, you are sacrificing fruit flavor. Or you have to try to avoid excess nitrogen and water because again, this is going against the development of full flavor. We have to try to select optimal integrated crop management systems based not only on yield, but also thinking on other characteristics, on flavor as an example. So the message is trying to optimize cultural practices towards a more balanced orchard, thinking about what our consumers want. Then another key factor in terms of flavor development is the maturity at harvest and the harvest practices. So what I'm showing you here are different stages of development throughout ripening of plums in this case. This is a picture from my PhD. So we know that when the fruit is fully, fully ripe, it's when it's going to have its richest flavor components and we are going to enjoy it the best. When we have fruit that is harvested be before this time, we don't have flavor completely developed. And when we have fruit that is harvested after this time when the fruit is overripe, we are going to have development of different type of flavors, like fermentation or stuff like this. So we know that when we harvest fruit before this fully ripe stage, we are going to have better capacity of handling the fruit and we are going to have less susceptibility to decay. But when we wait to be in this side of the fruit, we are going to have low capacity of handling and it's going to be highly susceptible to decay or to bruising. So this is the balance that we always try to have to try to accomplish. But the message here again is that harvesting at the correct maturity stage is going to be key for maximizing stone fruit flavor development. Another important message here to say is that once you harvest the fruit, that is the maximum quality that you are going to reach of your fruit. When the fruit is out of the tree, the only thing you can do is try to maintain that quality or bring it down. You are never going to improve it. So you have to have that in mind when you decide to harvest your fruit. 
And I think this slide kind of represents very nicely the situation of when to decide how to harvest your fruit. And I stole it from a colleague. Um, so this is all of you, the growers, trying to decide when to harvest their fruits. If you do it too late, you will have maybe more flavor, but it's going to be more difficult to handle. It's going to be more softened. And if you harvest too early, maybe you will have poor flavor. It will never ripen. You will not have repeated bites of your fruit, etc. So this is something where more research is needed to try to find this balance and give you better advice. And finally, last but not least, are all what is related with post-harvest practices in terms of flavor development. Um, these are just some tips. Uh, when you are storing stone fruits, you have to consider this temperature per time interaction. Definitely, you don't want to store your fruit between this range of temperatures. Why not? Because at this range of temperatures is where you are going to have the highest susceptibility to the development of chilling injury symptoms. When I talk about chilling injury, I'm referring to the fruit getting mealy, getting browned, and the first, first ever symptom of chilling injury is the loss of flavor or this development of, of flavors. So we have to avoid this range of temperatures. We are going to avoid trying to get breaks in the cold temperature chain. And we have to try to maintain high humidity of the fruit most of the time, all the time, really. And then I just wanted to briefly uh, talk about preconditioning, which is a practice that is used in order to try to maintain fruit flavor after the fruit is harvested, which consists on holding the fruit at a temperature of around 68 degrees for 28 to 24 to 48 hours before you submit the fruit to cold storage. And this will help the fruit to be less susceptible to chilling injury, but the considerations that have to be, con that have to be had here is to, uh, that there is going to be way loss occurring and softening of the fruit when you expose your fruit to preconditioning. So you have to be monitoring those closely. And finally, just to wrap up, take home messages, just as a summary. We looked at what fruit flavor is. It's an interaction between taste as well as these aroma volatiles that are being emitted by the fruit. We saw that stone fruit flavor is strongly associated to consumer liking and that the focus has to be placed more on consumers. That fruit flavor presents a major opportunity to grow markets. And then we looked at some of the factors that are affecting the development of flavor. We looked at the genetic background, this cultivar and rootstock interaction. We looked at the environment. I mentioned about setting up these small trials in order to check how these rootstock cultivar combinations are evolving in your own environmental conditions. Pre-harvest orchard management practices, trying to optimize them towards a more balanced orchard. Maturity at harvest. Avoid focusing only on the appearance and the shelf life because this is always going to go at the expense of flavor. And finally, in terms of post-harvest practices, some of the tips that I gave you. Avoiding these temperatures, favor preconditioning, and avoiding any breaks in the cold chain. So with that, I um, want to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions if there are. And please, I would really encourage you to submit the survey, please. It would help me a lot. So thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Yes. Nobody asked, I asked. So, um, what did you say? What uh, consumer, I mean, from consumer perspective, what would they care most? Flavor, nutritional value, and um, health capacity. Yeah, flavor and nutritional value mainly. Yeah. Do, do they not care about the price? Yeah. yeah, of course they care about the price, but that is is not an attribute of the fruit. That is something that we are adding to it. I was just wondering, because you, you have a better flavor fruit for double the price, and then, then that would change the consumers. Anyway, I am, from what I know, the consumers are willing, and this is all what my work in Melons was about. This seed company changed their, old strat their whole strategy because they were breeding for nice appearance, but the consumers are not buying their melons. So they had to change, and they're really worried now. We have to breed for flavor. 
And the consumers are willing to pay more if they are going to enjoy their food, but all that is happening is they are disappointed by all the melons they are getting. And the same thing happens with the stone fruits. So they are willing to pay more for getting a better fruit. Mongeen, I have to agree with her. I don't buy peaches in the store. I buy peach, my peaches locally. And when my local suppliers have those varieties that I wait all year for, I don't look at the price. Because that I'm waiting all year for that perfectly tree ripened white peach. And I don't buy peaches the rest of the year. What would it be the difference, price difference? I don't know, because I don't care. Okay. It's well, okay. seriously. It's that experience, and I think that other PYO people. Do you feel, see that same thing with your customers? Yeah, she says they would much Pretty rather right. pay a higher price yeah. for something that's got flavor yep. yeah. than to go to the grocery store and buy something that has no flavor and part of the rock. Yeah. <laughs> and never fall it. They'll rock it where it'll fall it. Yeah. They'll buy locally. I have no, no trouble because I go through, I don't know how many, probably 20, 30 half bushels of peaches every every Saturday during peach, peach season. And I'm one of the highest priced ones in our farmers' markets. They don't care. Price don't make them never mind. When they want something that's good, price is no option. Yeah. The thing is that I think the disappointment is so huge for so many years that now they just want to buy, pay for the experience because that's what they want. So that's the big, the big thing here. And the industry is changing slowly, but it's important that the whole food supply chain understands this. Um, and what consumers are wanting. That's the message. Really. But well, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much.